the wasp factory chapter three in the bunker my greatest my greatest enemies are women and the sea these things i hate because women they are weak and stupid and live in the shadow of men and are nothing compared to them and the sea because it has always frustrated me destroying what i have built washing away what i have left wiping clean the marks i have made and i'm not at all sure the wind is blameless either the sea is sort of mythological a mythological enemy and i make what you might call sacrifices to it in my soul fearing it a little respecting it as you're supposed to but in many ways treating it as an equal it does things to the world and so do I. We should both be feared. Women, well, women are a bit too close for comfort as far as I'm concerned. I don't even like having them on the island, not even Mrs. Clamp, who comes over every week on, on a Saturday, every week on a Saturday to clean the house and deliver our supplies. She's ancient and sexless, the way the very old and the very young are. But she's still been a woman, and I resent that for my own good reason. I woke the next morning wondering if my father had come back or not. Without bothering to dress, I went to his room. I was going to try the door, but I could hear him snoring before I touched the handle, so I turned and went to the bathroom. In the bathroom, after I piss, I went through my daily washing ritual. First, I had my shower. The shower is the only time in any 24 hour period I take my underpants right off. I put the old pair in the dirty linen and in the dirty linen bag in the airing cupboard, I showered carefully starting at my hair ending between my toes and under my toenails. Sometimes when I have to make precious substances such as toenail cheese or belly button fluff, I have to go without a shower or a bath for days and days. I hate doing this because I soon feel dirty and itchy. And the only bright thing about such abstinence is how good it feels to have a shower at the end of it. After my shower and a brisk rub down with a first with First a face cloth, then a towel. I trim my nails, then I brush my teeth thoroughly with my electric toothbrush. Next, the shave. I always use shaving foam and the latest razors, twin blades, swivel heads are state of the art at the moment. Removing the downy brown growth of previous days and night with dexterity and precision. As with all my As with all my ablutions, the shave follows a definite and predetermined pattern. I take the same number of strokes of the same length in the same sequence each morning. As always, I felt a rising tingle of excitement as I contemplated the... Hmm. Oh as I contemplated the meticulously shorn surfaces of my face. I blew and picked my nose clean, washed my hands, cleaned the razor, nail clipper, shower, and basin, rinsed out the flannel, I co the flannel and combed my hair. Happily, I didn't have any spots, so there was nothing else required but a final hand wash and a clean pair of underpants. I placed all my washing materials, tower, towel, razor, and so forth exactly where they should be, wiped a little steam off the mirror on the bathroom cabinet, and returned to my room. There I put, my, there I put on my socks, green for that day, then a khaki shirt with pockets. In the winter, I'd have a vest underneath and a green army jumper over the shirt but not in the summer. My green cord trousers came next, followed by 
my fawn kicker boots kickers boots labels removed as from everything i wear because i refuse to be a walking advertisement for anybody my combat jacket knife bags catapult and other equipment i took down to the kitchen with me it was still early and the rain i'd heard forecast the previous night was looking about ready to drop i had my modest breakfast and i was ready i went out into the front fresh damp morning walking quickly to keep warm and get around the island before any rain started the hills beyond the town were hidden by cloud and the sea was rough as the wind freshened the grass was heavy with dew drops of mist bowed the unopened flowers and clung to my sacrifice poles too like clear blood on the shriveled shriveled heads and tiny desiccated bodies a couple of jets screamed over the island at one point two jaguars wing to wing about a hundred meters up going fast crossing the whole island in an eye blink and racing out to sea i glared at them then went on my way once they made me jump once they made me jump another couple of them a couple of years ago they came in illegally low after bombing practice on the range just down the firth blasting over the island so suddenly that i jumped while in the delicate maneuver of teasing a wasp into a jar the old tree stump near me the ruined sheep pen at the north end of the island the wasp stung me i went into town that day brought an extra plastic model of a jaguar made the kit up that afternoon and ceremonial ceremonially blew it to pieces on the roof of the bunker with a small pipe bomb two weeks later a jaguar crashed into the sea off nairn though the pilot ejected in time i'd like to think the power was working then but i suspect it was coincidence high performance jets crash so often it was no real surprise my symbolic and their real destruction came within a fortnight of each other i sat on the earth banking that looks over that looks out over the muddy creek and ate an apple I leaned back on the young tree that, as a sapling, had been the killer. It was grown now and a good bit smaller than me, but when I was young and we were the same size, it had been my static catapult defending the southerly approaches to the island. Then, as now, it looked out over the broad creek and the gunmetal colored mud with the eating with the eating with the with the eaten looking wreck of an old fishing boat sticking out of it after the tale of old Saul I put the catapult to another use and it became the killer scourge of hamsters mice and gerbils I remember that it could whack a fist-sized stone well over the creek and 20 meters more into the undulating ground on the mainland, and once I got keyed into its natural rhythm, I could send off a shot every two seconds. I could place them anywhere within a six-degree angle by varying direction in which I pulled the sapling over and down. I didn't use a little animal every two... I didn't use a little animal every two seconds. They were expended at a few a week. For six months, I was the best customer in Port Neal Pet Shop. Going in every Saturday to get a couple of beasts and about every month buying a tube of badminton, badminton shuttlecocks, shuttlecocks, fuck me, shuttlecocks from the toy shop as well i doubt anybody ever put the two together apart from me it was all 
for a purpose, of course. Little that little that I do is not one way or another. It was looking for old Saul's skull. I threw the core of, a, of the apple over the creek. It plopped into the mud on, on the far bank with, satis, with a satisfying slurp. I decided it was time to look into the bunker properly. I set off along the bank at a jog, swinging around the southmost dune towards the old pillbox. I stopped to look at the shore. There didn't seem to be anything interesting there, but I remembered the lesson of the day before when I stopped to sniff the air and everything had seemed fine. Then ten minutes later, I was wrestling with a kamikaze rabbit, so I trotted down off the side of the dune and down to the line of debris thrown up by the sea. There was one bottle, a very minor enemy, and, and empty. I went down to the water line, threw the bottle out. It bobbed head up 10 meters out. The tide hadn't covered the pebbles yet, so I took a handful and lobbed them at the bottle. It was close enough to use the underarm style, and the pebbles I'd selected were all roughly the same size. So my fire was very accurate. Four shots within splashing distance, and a fifth which smashed the neck of the bottle. A small victory, really, because the decisive defect of the, bottle, of the bottles had come about long ago, shortly after I learned to throw when I first realized the sea was an enemy. I st it's, it still tried me. It still tried me out now and again, though, now and again, though, and I was in no mood to allow even the slightest encroachment on my territory. The bottle sunk. I returned to the dunes, went to the top of one of the bunker lay, to the top of one of the bunker lay half buried in, and had a look around with my binoculars. The coast was clear. Even if the weather wasn't, I went down to the bunker. I repaired the steel door years ago, loosening the rusted hinges and straightening the guides for the bolt. I took out the key <clears throat> to the padlock and opened the door. Inside, there was the familiar waxy burn smell. I closed the door and propped a piece of wood against it, then stood for a while, letting my eyes adjust to the gloom and my mind to the feel of the place. After a while, I could see dimly by the light filtering through the sacking hung, the sacking hung over the two narrow slits, which are bunkers are the bunkers only windows. I took off my shoulder bag and binoculars and hung them on nails hammered into the slightly crumbling concrete. I took up the tin with the matches in it and lit the candles. They burned yellowy and I knelt clenching my fists and thinking I'd found the candle making kit in the cupboard under the stairs five or six years ago and experimented with the colors and consistencies for months before hitting the idea, hitting on the idea of using the wax as a wasp prison. I looked up then saw the head of a wasp poking up from the top of the candle on the altar. The newly lit candle, blood red and as thick as my wrist, contains the still flame and the tiny head within its cauldra of wax, like pieces of an alien game. As I watched the flame, as I watched the flame, a centimeter behind the wasp wax gummed wasp's wax gummed head freed the antenna from the grease and they came upright for a while before they frazzled. The head start started to smoke as the whacked wax dribbled off of it. Then the fumes caught light, then the wasp body, a second flame within the crater. 
flickering and crackling as the fire incinerated the insect from its head down. I lit the candle inside the skull of old Saul. That orb of bone, hold and yellowed and yellowing, was what I killed all those little creatures who met their death in the mud on the far side of the creek. I watched the smoky flame waver inside the place where the dog's brains used to be, and I closed my eyes. I saw the rabbit grounds again and the flaming bodies as they jumped and sped. I saw again the one that escaped the grounds and, and died just before it made it to the stream. I saw the black destroyer and remembered its demise. I thought of Eric, and I wondered what the factory's warning was about. I saw myself, Frank L. Claude, Claudheim, and I saw myself as I might have been, a tall, slim man, strong and determined and making his way in the world, assured and purposeful. I opened my eyes and gulped, breathing deeply. A fetid light blazed from old Saul's sockets and candles on either side of the altar flickered with the skull flame in a drought. I looked around the bunker. I looked around the bunker. The severed heads of gulls, rabbits, crowns, mice, crows, mice, owls, moles, and small lizards looked down on me. They hung drying on short loops of black thread suspended from lengths of string stretched across the walls from corner to corner, and dim shadows turned slowly on the walls behind them. Around the foot of the walls, on plinths of wood or stone, or in bottles and cans, the sea had surrendered. My collection of skulls watched me. The yellow brain bones of horses, dogs, birds, fish, and honored sheep faced in honored sheep faced in towards old Saul some with beaks jaws open some shut the teeth exposed like drawn claws to the right of the brick wo brick wood and concrete altar where the candles and the skull sat were my small files of precious fluids to the left rose a tall set of clear plastic drawers designed to hold screws, washers, nails, and hooks. Each drawer, not much larger than a small matchbox, held the body of a wasp, which had been through the factory. I reached over for a large tin on my right, prized the tight lid off with my knife, and used a small teaspoon inside to place some of the white mixture from the tin on the ground from the tin on a round metal plate in front of the old dog's skull then i took the oldest of the wasp cadavers from its little tray and tipped it on the white pile of granules i replaced the sealed tin and the plastic drawer and lit the tiny pyre with a match the mixture of sugar and weed killer sizzled and glared. The intense light that seared through me and the clouds of smoke rolled up and around my head as I held my breath and my eyes watered. In a second, the blaze was over. The mixture and the wasp, a single black lump of scarred and blistered debris cooling from the bright yellow heat. I closed my eyes to inspect the patterns, but only the burning after image remained, fading like the glow on the metal plate. It danced about briefly on my retinas, then disappeared. I had hoped for Eric's face or some further clue about what was going to happen, but I got nothing. I leaned forward, blew out the wasp candle, right, then left, then blew through 
one eye and extinguish the candle inside the dog skull. Still glare blind, I felt my way to the door through the dark and the smoke. I went out, letting the smoke and fumes free into the damp air. Coils of blue and gray curled off my hair and clothes as I stood there, breathing deeply. I closed my eyes for a bit, then went back into the bunker to tidy up. I closed the door and locked it, went back to the house for lunch, found my father chopping driftwood in the back garden. Good day, he said, wiping his brow. It was humid, if not particularly warm, and he was stripped to the vest. Hello, I said. Were you all right yesterday? I was. I didn't get back till late. I was asleep. I thought you might be. You'll be wanting some lunch. I'll make it today if you want. No, that's all right. You can chop the wood if you have a mind to. I'll make lunch for us. He put the axe down, wiped his hands on his trousers, eyeing me. Was, was everything quiet yesterday? Oh, yes, I nodded, standing there. Nothing happened? Nothing special, I assured him, putting down my gear and taking my jacket off. I took up the axe, very quiet, in fact. Good, he said, apparently convinced, then went into the house. I started swinging the axe at the lumps of driftwood. After lunch, I went into town, taking gravel, my bike, and some money. I told my father I'd be back before dinner. I started. It started to rain when I was halfway to Port Neal, so I stopped to put on my kegel. The going was heavy, but I got there without mishap. The town was gray and empty in the dull afternoon. Cars swished through on the road going north, some with their headlights on, making everything else seem even dimmer. I went to the gun and tackle shop first to see old McKenzie and to take another of his American hunting catapults off him, and some air gun pellets too. And how are you today, young man? Oh, very well. And yourself? Oh, not too bad. You know, he said, shaking his gray head slowly, his yellowed eyes and hair rather slickly, sickly in the electric light of the shop. We always say the same thing to each other. Often I say, longer, stay longer in the shop than I mean to because it smells so good. And how's that uncle of yours these days? I haven't seen him for, oh, a while. He's well. Oh, good. Good, Mr. McKenzie said, screwing up his eyes with a slightly pained expression and nodding slowly. I nodded too and looked at my watch. Well, I must be going. I said, I must be going, I said, and started to back off, putting my new catapult into my day pack and back on my day pack on my back and stuffing the pellets wrapped in brown paper into my combat jacket pockets. Oh, well, if you must, you must, said McKenzie, nodding at the glass counter as though inspecting the right, as though inspecting the flies, reels, and duck calls within. He took up a cloth by the side of the cash register and started to move it slowly over the surface, looking up just once as I left the shop, saying goodbye, then, goodbye then, yes, goodbye. In the First View Cafe, apparently the location of some awful and localized ground substance since it was named, because it would have to be at least a story taller to catch a view <clears throat> of the water. I had a cup of coffee and a game of Space Invaders. They had a new machine in, but after a pound or so, I had mastered it and won an extra spaceship. I got bored with it and sat down with my coffee. 
I inspected the posters on the cafe walls to see if there was anything interesting happening in the area in the near future. But apart from the film club, there wasn't much. The next showing was the Tin Drum, but that was a book by but that was a book my father had bought me years ago, one of the few real presents he has ever given me. And I had therefore a assiduously avoided reading it just as I had Myra Beckenbridge Beckenridge another of his rare gifts mostly my father just gives me the money